Hello everybody! Hello and very welcome to the fourth session of the Community of Practice. The Atlas TI Community of Practice is a space where researchers share their best practices about the integration of Atlas TI in their data analysis projects. We created this project because we strongly believe that it is essential to learn from experience of others from all over the world. I am Neringa Kalpokaite, Regional Manager of Training and Partnership Development for Europe, Atlas TI, and I will just introduce a few technical concepts you need to know about this presentation before we start. This presentation will be conducted through GoToWebinar, System for Web Conferencing. If you happen to get disconnected from this session, you have just to click again on the link received from GoToWebinar. If the presenter, or in my case, if I disconnect, we will do exactly the same thing. But in that case, please be patient. It may take just a few minutes or seconds to us to come back. But we hope that none of, none of this will happen today. During the presentation, your microphones will be muted in order to avoid background noise and echo. But please feel free to write down your questions and comment during the presentation using the control panel. In fact, you can mm, try to do it right now just to say hello and practice with the control panel. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to read your questions and I will pass the microphone to those who want to speak. Now, I am going to give the microphone to Dr. Ricardo Contreras, the Director of Training and Partnership Development of Atlas TI, to formally open the session, and later on I will, I will introduce today's presenter. So, Ricardo, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Neringa, and thank you everybody for, for, for joining us uh, today. Dr. Trina Paulos will be presenting uh, her work using Atlas DI, uh, and I believe it's similar to what she presented a couple of weeks ago in Berlin, uh, where we had our first user uh, conference. Uh, several people, a lot of people from different countries joined us. It's a very good opportunity uh, to get to know what people are doing. Uh, the, the purpose of the Community of Practice uh, webinar series is to have something like a permanent congress so that once a month we will be hearing from uh, different researchers about how they incorporate Atlas TI into their research projects. Uh, and, and Dr. Uh, Trina Paulos will be precisely uh, the first, the first one to do this uh, in the English language. So uh, thank you very much, Trina, and thank you very much, everybody. So now, please, um, uh, Neringa, uh, I leave it. I leave it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are happy to have with us today Dr. Trina Paulos, who will present for about thirty to thirty-five minutes, and after her presentation, she will take questions of all of you. Just a few words about Dr. Trena Paulus. She is an associate professor at the University of Tennessee, where she coordinates the graduate certificate program in qualitative research methods. And also she teaches courses in instructional technology. Her book, Digital Tools for Qualitative Research, will be published by SAGE in December of 2013, so pretty soon. Her primary area of research is discourse analysis of computer-mediated communication environments. And today, she is going to present a topic about using Atlas TI for discourse analysis of online interactional data. So, thank you, Trina, for being here with us today. And uh, I just am going to make you as a presenter now. And at the same time, I'm going to give you the microphone. So thank you very much for being here. And just in a second, you will be as a presenter. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Neringa and Ricardo. It's, it's a great opportunity to be here today. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, we can. One Wonderful. Um, as Ricardo mentioned, I, I was had the opportunity to give this talk at the first users conference in Berlin a few weeks ago, which was a great trial run 
um, for what I'd like to share with you today. I thought I would start by uh, sharing a little bit of uh, my positionality, as all good qualitative researchers should do, uh, is disclose sort of where they're coming from um, and how they approach the study, and in this case, the use of Atlas TI. I'll talk briefly about the context of the research study that I used Atlas TI for, and then uh, about five uh, specific functionalities and features in Atlas that we thought w we found very useful for this study. Um, how we used the tool for data management, collaboration, what's called unmotivated looking from a conversation analysis tradition, a focus on the process of what the discourse was doing in the text, and narrowing the analytic focus uh, using codes and queries. So you can see we used a variety of different tools um, for uh, accomplishing various aspects of the analysis. And then we'll, I'll just close with summarizing, uh, recapping some of the overall recommendations. So uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I do teach qualitative research courses and also have a background in instructional technology, and I do specifically look at how people talk to each other online in computer-mediated uh, communication environments, usually uh, in online learning environments because I am, I am in a college of education, so I'm really interested in how people learn when we put them online talking to each other as opposed to face-to-face. Um, what I found as I started doing more and more discourse analysis research was that few discourse researchers are using the software. Um, and I really started to notice this as we were working on our book on the chapter on data analysis software, looking at how different research traditions talked about software. And I found a lot of concerns um, that software is really only good for doing grounded theory. Um, and a lot of concerns that software is really only good if you're planning on doing coding. And a lot of discourse analysts don't describe their analytic approach as coding per se. So there was little guidance, um, little methodological guidance about how we might use Atlas for discourse research. So we sort of just made this up as we went along and now we're in the process of um, documenting it so that other researchers, in case they find it useful, will have somewhere to turn. Um, this was uh, the very first study that I did using Atlas TI in collaboration with Jessica Lester, who's now an assistant professor at Indiana University. Uh, we worked together on this project and kind of um, figured out how to use Atlas along the way with the help of Ricardo and others at Atlas. Uh, and so that's kind of how we got to uh, where we are today. So the context of this study is uh, an undergraduate nutrition course here at the University of Tennessee. We were collaborating with the professor of that course um, because she wanted to use some online discussion tools to increase interaction and engagement. Um, I'm sure a lot of you who are in educational environments at universities are familiar with very large lecture courses where there's not a lot of interaction. And so small group discussions can be difficult face to face, but once you go online and people can post at any time and from anywhere, you can usually generate more interaction that way. We were particularly focused on um, the student learning in nutrition of dietary supplement use. And by dietary supplements, we mean things like weight loss pills, uh, protein powders to enhance muscle development, vitamins, herbs, all of those sorts of things. So we uh, designed a task where we put the students in small groups to engage in blogging. Now this wasn't um, a blogging activity kind of out in the real world of the internet using Blogger or WordPress or anything like that. These were blogs set up within our learning management system at our university in Blackboard. And we had the small groups um, post their beliefs about dietary supplements and their experiences with them before they read the textbook or had a lecture about the official information about dietary supplements. And then we had them comment on each other's posts. So it was kind of a, a pre-learning activity to have them be able to share what they already knew and what they already believed. And then they would go about their attending the lecture and reading the textbook. And then after they learned about uh, dietary supplements, we asked them to post a, another blog post about what they had learned and what the comments were on that. And 
so those two uh, parts of the task we've actually done separate analyses on and at the end of the presentation I have the full citations of the two published uh, research articles that came out of those studies uh, in case you're interested more specifically in the content of the studies or the outcome of our discourse analysis work because I won't be talking a lot about that today. Um, our, as, as those of you who are familiar with discourse analysis work know, there are lots of different approaches to discourse analysis and the one that we were using for this study um, comes out of uh, discursive psychology uh, which draws heavily on conversation analysis tools and uh, I'm in an educational psychology department so I have found discursive psychology a very interesting analytic tool to make sense of a lot of assumptions that we have in education about psychology and what happens in the mind. So our overall uh, research question or initial interest as we were approaching the data was how did students talk about their beliefs and their learning. Just a very simple question to kind of go to the data to figure out how students were engaging in this way. The first reason that we decided to use a data analysis package, um, as I said, I had never used one uh, extensively before, is that this did end up with, we, we did end up with a very large data set. We had hundreds of posts from students. I think there were, and I don't have the exact numbers, but maybe 150 students in the class, um, and then over a thousand comments. So we knew that we would have a lot of data that we needed to keep organized. And it seemed like this was a good opportunity to go ahead and use Atlas TI in, in large part as a project management tool. So we ended up copying and pasting all of the data, all of the conversations out of blogs and into Word documents um, as as our um, primary documents. So this is one of the, what I find a big challenge with doing research on online interaction is that there are not yet readily available tools to pull online interactional data offline and into an easy, easily analyzable format. Uh, our other option could have been to create new text files, new text documents within Atlas TI and I think that if we were to do this over again that's what we would do is just cut and paste the data out of the blogs directly into new text documents in Atlas TI. We then organized uh, primary documents by families. Uh, we had blog posts um, from, sorry, we had blog conversations from all the different sections of the lecture class and all of the different small groups within those sections. So in the United States, um, large lecture classes often have uh, smaller discussion sections of about 20 students each. And so each discussion section was then divided into two smaller discussion groups. And we wanted to be able to organize the blog conversations by each of those levels in case later we wanted to run queries about whether certain things were happening in certain small discussion groups and not others. So we really found the primary document family tool useful for keeping these data sets organized. The other thing that we did, because Jessica and I were working together on the analysis, we created, we used the quotation tool to create a, a priori units of analysis. Uh, and this was important for our teamwork approach and to be able to later merge our work, our separate analysis, uh, and like I mentioned before, run queries in a way that we were coding or memoing or hyperlinking the same amount of data uh, between the two researchers and we weren't just grabbing any part of the data um, and attaching codes or memos to it which could have been really confusing when we tried to combine it later. Here's a screenshot from the study of our primary document manager and let me see here. Um, this uh, shows you how we did organize our families um, by, and we, it really does require some forethought in terms of how you're going to name your primary documents. So this document, for example, is the pre-lecture discussions, you know, before they had the lecture and the reading on dietary supplement. Section 11, Group A, and here is the pre-lecture discussions from Section 11 of the course, Group B. Uh, and then we would organize um, 
those into families so that we were able to retrieve those later. So here, for example, are all of the primary documents that have the blog conversations from before the lecture. Um, so that, and then also what, what's very important in this project and really any project is using the comment field to explain every aspect of your data. So for each primary document, we explained in the comment field what this was from, how many students there were, how many comments, how many posts, um, all the information that we uh, wanted to be able to remember. And this is one way that I think tools like Atlas TI really um, add transparency to the research process, both for yourself as a researcher to remember why you did what you did, but also for others who might want to look at this later um, to validate your findings, so to speak. Can everybody still hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, the, um, the uh, little window disappeared, so I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sometimes you never know. Yeah. Okay, with the, the, ne <laughs> the next screenshot here uh, is just illustrating what I mentioned um, earlier, which is that we, u we did a priori uh, unitizing of the data so that we could add our uh, codes, memos uh, in a consistent way. So what we've done here was we segmented the blog comments and the blog posts with separate quotations. And that again really helped us be consistent with what, how we were tagging and annotating the data down the road. Um, so that's all this screenshot is showing. And it also, you can see that you know it was a Word document that we cut and paste from the blog uh, interface itself into Atlas for analysis um, and we did, <coughs> excuse me, and we did um, anonymize the data before we put it in here uh, and that's always good practice so that in case somebody would get a hold of the HU, um, you wouldn't have names attached to the posts and that does take a lot of work up front to just kind of get your data set ready to go. Uh, next, I'll talk about collaboration uh, and the process that Jessica and I followed. Um, just um, for those of you who do collaborate and how we found it useful as a tool, I started as the project lead by creating the HU and creating those quotations in advance. Uh, I then bundled the file, or made a, did a copy bundle and sent that to Jessica. And then separately, we each engaged in what's called unmotivated looking, which is sort of like open coding and grounded theory. Um, by just looking through and adding memos, uh, analytic memos for things that we were noticing, comments, uh, hyperlinks, network views, uh, just to kind of notice what was going on in the data. We were sure to use date stamps uh, to track. If you do control D in Atlas TI, that, that date stamps a memo or a comment so that you can again see how things change over time and we each set up our own um, user information so that when I was working on my HU it showed my name as being the one making the changes Jessica did the same then when we merged them we could see who had did what to the HU uh, Jessica then sent it hers back to me uh, I merged them and created a new HU uh, saving the two old ones but just creating a new one and then together we opened that up and went through it during a Skype call because we were not working, we were not living in the same place at the time. Uh, and then we decided on some broad codes that captured some of the big picture things that we were seeing uh, that we wanted to look at in more detail uh, because part of the process required that we really narrow our analytic focus because there's so many things that we could have looked at. Um, and then we, once we had some uh, larger scale codes, we went back to the data repeated the process and used those codes to narrow our analytic focus and I'll, I'll show you an example of that here in a second. Um, so this is just to illustrate for those of you who may not have used this feature that if you log in or set up a user ID within Atlas uh, it will it will mark who is doing what. So in this case this is a memo manager and you can see the ones that uh, Jessica added and the ones that I added. 
Uh, here's an example of when we engaged in the unmotivated looking. We actually chose to do this through memos, and we had a really good discussion around this at the user conference in Berlin with other researchers who would have chosen to use the code tool first. Other researchers said that they would have probably used the um, quotation comment feature instead of the memo feature. This is how we did it, and it worked well for us, but again, there's not one right way to do it necessarily, but we really wanted to write out extensively what was happening um, in each turn that the students were taking. Uh, so for example, here what you see is we wrote up a memo that sort of uh, explained line by line what we see happening in this initial post about supplements. And we have a male student here talking about how dietary supplements are very important. And so from a discourse perspective, we were just writing down um, what we think was happening with his language choices in this post. And here is where you can see um, the memo uh, was attached to this post. Uh, so that's how we started, was just going through and memoing um, everything that seemed important to us about um, the threads that stuck out to us the most. Then what we could do, and again, uh, you can do the network view with codes as well as quotations. Here we used a combination of these memos where we were annotating what was happening. And we pulled in quotations and memos, and then we used the hyperlinking feature to illustrate the relationships we were seeing among the different aspects of the thread and these blog conversations. And this really helped us visualize and map uh, the processes that were going on in the discourse. Uh, we really use this uh, a lot on the front end and then again at the very end of the study to help us visually see and that can be very useful for researchers um, from not only discourse traditions but narrative traditions and life history traditions uh, that really look at processes that they see in the data. Um, so what this shows then is eventually we did need to come up with, a, with codes that we wanted to use so that we could do some queries later um, with, with some of the patterns that we were starting to see going on um, in these blog conversations. So in this screenshot, um, <clears throat> the one of course powerful feature of, of data analysis software is the ability to code and retrieve. So when you're dealing with thousands of well, you know, thousands of posts and comments at the end of the day, it's important to be able to, to hone in on what you're really interested in. So one thing that we really started noticing was a lot of um, <clears throat> grounding of their arguments and claims in their personal experience. And that was really contrasted with their focus on their beliefs. So, you know, I had an experience with using weight loss supplements. They used, they worked great for me. I, I am, you know, I think that they're great. Whereas um, other people would say, you know, I believe that weight loss supplements are really dangerous, often because their parents or the doctor told them so, not because of their own experience with them, but because they were, they were told that or have that belief in some way. So we went through and coded all of the instances where the students were talking about personal experiences. And here um, there's 77 in this set. And then you can use Atlas to pull up just those 77 quotations for, for personal experience. You can look at them again in context, which can be important. But you can also then run a report of just those uh, quotations that were coded personal experience. And that can then become, if you like, a new primary document that you can add to your HU and just analyze in more detail those quotations if that help, is helpful for you. And that we found that, that tool to be really useful. Um, this screenshot also shows some of the um, organizational codes that we used. Um, the comments, we coded all the comments from the pre-lecture, comments from the post-lecture, um, the posts, pre and post, and again that, that's helpful just for organization and then eventually running queries to see uh, to be able to pull up all of the data, for example, where they talked about personal experiences only in post-lecture posts and look at that more closely. Um, and so to, go, to continue with that train of thought in terms of how we were narrowing our focus, we ran a co-occurrence at one point, which is an analytic tool that Atlas TI provides, 
uh, it makes some qualitative researchers nervous because it does pull up numbers and this table looks a lot like a chi-square analysis and people aren't really sure what they're supposed to do with that or think about it from a qualitative perspective. But we were just really interested to look more closely at whether our hunch um, was grounded in the data and that's that students who were against supplements often seem to ground those, be those um, beliefs in personal beliefs, not personal experience. Whereas people who were in favor of supplements often seem to ground those um, feelings in their personal experiences using supplements. So we did a query to pull all this together and uh, interestingly enough we did find that t almost twice as many times when they were pro-supplement it was based on their personal experience. Um, only 15 times when they were anti-supplement was it on their personal experience. So what does that mean? Well that's up to you as the researcher but what is useful is that once you click on these numbers all of those quotations that were coded as both pro-supplement and personal experience will come up and you can look at them more closely and kind of trace how they're making those arguments and that's really useful too and then you can compare across the different categories. Um, the another feature that well so this kind of concludes um, specifically talking about the online interactional data from a discourse analysis perspective and some of the features that we found useful uh, but I did want to mention one other useful feature uh, for those of you who do discourse or conversation analysis work and that's the ability of associated documents uh, to synchronize your transcript with the actual audio video file in order to stay closer to your data. Um, oftentimes uh, once we transcribe our recordings we often forget about the recordings and just focus on the transcript in part because it's faster to read through our data than it is to listen to it. But with Atlas TI, uh, it's, and there are other software tools out there that do this like Inscribe for example, but now that Atlas supports this, um, it's great to be able to do this all in the same uh, software tool. You can actually add what's called anchors in your transcript. So on your left side here, this is a transcript of a conversation. And you can go through and add anchors at certain points in the conversation and that is synchronized with the audio file so that as you're reading through the transcript, if you say, well, I want to hear exactly how she said this again, you just click on this segment in Atlas TI and you listen just to that part of your data again. Uh, and that is a really powerful tool, a powerful way, again, to be able to stay very close to your data, to have a lot of transparency, and to, to attend to not only what was said in your interview or in the conversation that you're analyzing, but how it was said, because you can listen to it again right away. And that's really been very helpful. Um, and so overall, um, the recommendations that we would make for discourse researchers is that it can be really helpful um, to you for project management, as I mentioned, especially if you're working with large data sets. Uh, for analysis tools beyond coding, um, you may not ever use the codes at all if what you really want to do is to just be able to annotate what you see happening and write a narrative account. Um, of what you see in the data and the hyperlinking tools to connect uh, one quotation with another quotation to show that a process is going on and then illustrate that in your network view. Uh, it can support systematic collaboration uh, between your colleagues again by tagging who did what in the HU um, <clears throat> and that can be <clears throat> important to establish uh, validity of your study. It transparently documents all of the decisions that you make by using the date stamps, use the comment fields to uh, explain the rationale for your codes, to document why the primary documents are there. And especially if you're using audio data, I think um, it's really useful for helping you stay close to the data uh, and not forget what your original data source was. <clears throat> And um, let's see, that is, that is all I have and I'm happy to take questions. Um, as I mentioned, these are the two um, articles that have come out of this uh, study that, we, that I was talking with you about today. And then um, as was introduced, uh, this is our book that's coming out and we do have a, 
a whole chapter on uh, data, anal data analysis software and how it can be used for text and also a chapter for how it can be used for audio video data. So some of you might find that helpful as well. Thank you very much, Jenna. It was a terrific presentation. I enjoyed it very much. And now let's uh, have a look if we have some questions. And uh, the suggestion, if all of you, you have a question, you have just to click on the hand icon that you will find in control panel, and I will give the microphone to you. So let's have a look if we have some questions. I cannot see any question. Okay, and let's have a look in question pane. Neither, no questions. So, Ricardo, would you like to ask a question or to comment about the presentation? I will open your microphone. Well, ah. uh, I just want to invite people to 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 make uh, comments and, and, and ask questions or add something to Trina's presentation. This is always a very good opportunity for us to have a kind of a exciting conversation about uh, not only Atlas DI but also Atlas DI within a methodological context. Uh, so let me let me wait for let's wait for a little bit for people to to maybe uh, uh, participate. Okay, I see that Karin, she, she wrote that she has no microphone set up, but she wanted to say thank you for a great presentation. She found it very interesting presentation. And she says, I was struck by the idea of starting with memos rather than coding in particular, which seems very useful. So thank you very much, Jenna. And Devlin also has a question. So maybe I will give the microphone to Devlin, just a second. Devlin, I will open the microphone. Here you are, Devlin. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. I was just curious about, um, you said there was a discussion about using memos versus the quotation comments. and I've used memos a lot um, to kind of capture just immediate thoughts that I have that I don't want to lose, but then I end up with a list of 160 of little scraps of thought, and they're not necessarily useful to me later. So I was wondering how you use that and what your thoughts are between the two different tools you mentioned. Thank you very much, Devlin. Thank you. And Trena, I will open your microphone. The microphone, Trena, is yours. That's a great question, um, and yes, I think that when we first started working on this project, we also ended up with many, 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 many memos, and while we all know that qualitative research is recursive and you have to go back through your data, you know, more than once, sometimes it it can get a little tedious if you find that you've you've created so many memos and now you have to do something with them, and the difference between memos and codes is that with codes, it's actually easier to merge codes um, and rename them and consolidate them if you start out with too many and it's not as easy to do that with memos. Um, I think that the way that I remember Ricardo taught us how to use the difference between memos and quotations um, is that if you have just an insight about a particular quotation or memos, sorry, memos and comments on quotations. If you just, if, if what you want to capture are your aha moments just on a particular part of the data, then it's better to put that in a comment on the quotation. And it's only when it's a sort of broader aha moment across your study that you should then put it in a memo. And one reason I had not done that was because, you know, the memo has a nice manager there and I can go through the manager and very easily go back through all of my memos and figure out which ones to keep and which ones to delete. Um, where, but then at the conference, uh, Susanna Fries showed us, I don't know why I never realized this before, that if you pull up the quotation manager, you can actually pretty easily see all of the comments that you've made on particular quotations. And that made me think, okay, maybe I'll start using that comment feature on individual quotations more and leave the memos 
for bigger pictures. But here's how I would really solve the problem is if I ended up with 150 memos now, I do a save as, create a new HU, and keep all of those memos in the first version of the HU, but then in the second version of the HU, I start deleting memos that aren't important right now. <laughs> and I start either uh, consolidating them or somehow just rewording them to really, just like you do with codes, winnow them down to the memos that are really important for the next phase of the study. That way you haven't lost them because they're still in the previous version of your HU. Um, but you can, you don't have to, um, you know, you just can start deleting more at will to kind of make, the, make that into a more manageable size. It can also be useful to use memo families and categori categorize memos by type and then be able to, um, well, actually, I don't know if you can do memo families. Are there families for memos, Ricardo and Naringa? Yes, there are. I mean, are there family? There are families for memos, yeah. yeah so you, can, you can use the families feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that can help organize too. So that's, um, those are just some of my initial thoughts. I don't know if that's helpful, but. Of course, yes. Uh, we have another question from Stathy. Uh, I'm not very sure how to pronounce the name. Um, um, he, she, he wants to ask uh, your advice about how to make your memos more effective as a documentation tool. As a what tool? Sorry. Documentation tool. How to make memos more effective? As a documentation tool. I guess I don't understand what a commendation tool. Uh, 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 may I? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, yes. Yes, she's asking um, uh, Trina's advice about how to make your memos more effective as a documentation tool. Oh, yeah, documentation tool. Yes, um, I think that uh, there's several things I try to do with each study now. Um, I we often use the memo tool to as um, as a researcher journal. Uh, you know, good good qualitative research practice really encourages uh, engaging in regular re reflexivity and reflection on what you're seeing. And so often I recommend to students that they keep a research journal. And I used to have them do that on blogs or um, where I could respond to their blog posts or um, as Word documents. But if you're using Atlas TI as a project management tool, you can actually engage in those reflections as memos and be very careful to name them and date stamp them uh, and use the use the tag the memo lets you choose a memo type and just create a memo type that says re, you know research or journal and keep regular entries um, or just you know you don't even necessarily have to create a new memo each time you could have one memo that's the research journal and then you just date stamp everything throughout it uh, so I would definitely move my research journal and reflexivity into the memos um, also, just keeping meeting minutes or notes from the, the research meetings that you have, especially if you're working collaboratively, just document it right there in your memo, have a different tag for those memos that are called um, meeting, min sorry, meeting minutes, again, use the date stamp, capture um, all the decisions that were made. I find it's really important to do that after each session in which I'm working in Atlas. It's amazing how, you know, it's like this with every project. You think you'll remember what you were doing, but you come back a week or two weeks later and you can't remember where you were. So ending each session by having minutes, either meeting minutes with your collaborators or just notes to yourself, but doing it in a consistent way about what the last thing was that you that you did and what the next thing is that you need to work on. Um, you really can just look at it as a notebook with all different um, or a binder with different notebooks inside of it uh, to document um, the whole research process that you're engaging in. I tell my students that they can look at memos as uh, where you start writing your, your research report. And I know uh, Susanna Fries talks about this as well. You can start, you know, when you are when you are drafting out your findings, do it as a memo. Now, the downside is that the, it's not a, a robust word processor. It's not like you can you can you know format those memos in a way that you would a, a Microsoft Word document. But the upside is is that it's all there within your HU, and you can pull up that memo manager and sort by which type of memo you want to go back to and look at. 
uh, and I really just between the memos and the co always using the comment field on every object that you create I think those tools are really powerful for transparently documenting what's happening and it takes discipline that's for sure I mean I don't always practice what I preach like I should and I'm learning slowly uh, that I need to be doing that because if you think about your HU as your um, audit trail you know you always think about somebody else looking at your HU and needing to understand what it is that you did that's a way to, to help yourself get in that frame of mind thank you very much Trena anybody else would like to ask a question if you have a question you have just to click on the hand icon that you will find in control panel and I will give the uh, microphone to you yes Neringa? yes um, I saw that Alex had his uh, hand raised a few minutes ago, so maybe he or she uh, has a question. Yes, let's open his or her microphone. Thank you, Ricardo. Alex, the microphone is yours. Can you just hear me? Yes, perfectly. All right, so the one thing I was wondering, it looked like at the beginning you were working with a heavy volume of comments, like over a thousand. So if you repeat the research after you do that inductive analysis at the beginning and kind of identify here are the top themes of what customers are saying, uh, at any point do you switch over to the auto coding functionality to begin coding some of those smaller segments or do you just stick with hand coding all of that data? Thank you very much. And Trena, the microphone is yours. Yeah, I'm a hand coder all the way. Um, I've never, well, I haven't yet used auto coding, but I did see a couple presentations at the conference in Berlin that that might have convinced me um, of its use for some some really specific uh, things. Um, for example, uh, I have a doctoral student who just finished conducting seventy uh, in uh, tape recording seventy meetings in the schools. They're called IEP meetings here in the states. They're they're meetings to decide whether students need special education services. So she's recorded seventy one hour meetings and transcribed them all. And she knows that she wants to look specifically at. Um, questions and when questions were asked and she's already she's already done some initial coding but we're trying to figure out a way that she can use the autocode feature to really drill down to kind of do some initial finding of of what she wants to look at because that's even more data than what I had for this study um, I also find that the um, the control F just the search features can be really useful to get you to what you you know if you have some a priori words, phrases, ideas that you really want to focus on. Those search tools um, are going to be really helpful. And then I guess if you did the search tools first and then you decided you wanted to auto code because you were really sure that you wanted to uh, code certain words and phrases in a certain way, then that could be really useful. Um, but we didn't use it for this study and I haven't gotten to the point yet where uh, I've figured out a way to use it successfully. Do you have um are do you have some data that you're thinking about using it with using the autocode feature? The microphone is yours. Uh, um, uh, Alex, maybe uh, he has something to add? Yes. The microphone is yours. Oh, now I'm now I'm muted. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we we work with a lot of um, heavier data sets to where we kind of go and identify some themes beforehand. So we've seen some benefits with the auto coding, but for kind of what you did going into something that was completely unexplored, I wondered, you know, if you had to do it again, would you be able to feel confident that you could refine those enough to where daily you could run that same blog post, auto code, and get the same results that you got by yourself? I don't think so, um, and I don't um, know. And you, when you, when you, uh, if you take a look at our full papers, you'll see that um, we aren't really. It's not so, themes so much that were part of the findings or categories or words 
specifically, it was more processes and how students talked. And because there's so many variations, um, well, I guess the one thing that could have worked is we we noticed that students often started their comments with "I don't really know," but because we we what we found is that students students are often mitigating their own expertise when asked to publicly display their knowledge in these online discussion forums. So instead of saying, I definitely feel this way, they start out by saying, well, I'm not really sure or I don't know. But there's so many different ways that that could be said that I'm not sure how the autocoding would work because it's not like we documented here are 20 ways to say I don't know and we can go on, you know, we could go through and, and autocode that to find it. Uh, it was more just, it was the pattern and, and uh, you know, noticing that they said this in many different ways, but that the function was the same. Uh, it served to downgrade their own expertise in these forums because students often don't want to show off or, or display that they know anything in front of their peers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's cool that that works, that works for you guys, for what, for what you're working on. I, I'm still kind of not convinced that that would work for the kind of work that I do, but it's something I definitely want to look into more because I know that that feature is very attractive to people when look when they're looking at the what the software can do. Thank you very much, Trina. I will read some some comments. For instance, Tani say that uh, no, not Tani. Sorry, Blas wants to say thank you very much for an interesting lecture. I'm rather new in using Atlas AI, but I found instructive. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I hope there will be more webinars. For sure, there will be more webinars, and I will announce it uh, when we will finalize the session. Also, um, there are more people saying, for instance, Greg, uh, I know I definitely need Atlas AI for my thesis research, and so. It's great, thank you. And Misha also say thank you for a great presentation. So anybody else would like to ask a question? Just raise your hands. Uh, I... uh, Naringa, uh, yes. uh, what Karin wrote earlier, uh, mm -hmm. maybe it's something that Trina has not yet addressed, which is the following. Um, I was struck by the idea of starting with memos rather than coding. Uh, and that, for her, seems uh, very useful, according to, to Karen. So maybe uh, Trina could uh, comment on that. Sure. Um, <laughs> we did have a we did have a very interesting discussion about this in Berlin. I can't remember who oh, oh, with Janine Evers and uh, myself and Susanna Fries, um, because they were not convinced that you should ever start with memos. So it was a very interesting discussion. Um, I think that a lot of discourse analysis researchers, including myself, have this sort of reluctance to call what they're doing coding. Um, and it's not necessarily grounded in the reality of what the tool is actually doing, but codes seem very final to me. Uh, to, to call something a code means it has, it has a heavy meaning that sometimes I'm not ready to give my initial thoughts in a research study. And that's why I think the idea of using a memo, it just sounds more like what I'm trying to do, which is make notes about what I'm noticing. I don't, I, you know, before I started using software, I didn't start with codes. Um, I started with just making little notes in the margins of the, of the pages, and then I would look at all of those, and then I would decide what codes I wanted to go back and apply to the data. So part of it, I think, is just um, is just a decision based on what it sounds like the tool does. Uh, and but like I was mentioning to the other gentleman earlier, I think that the, the 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 problem can be you end up with way too many memos that you then can't necessarily do anything with. So you have to understand that you're going to have to go back and delete some memos or combine some memos or. Uh, cut and paste the text from one memo into another, just like you do with codes, you'll have to kind of make those memos more manageable in order for them to be meaningful. But we were okay with doing that. I mean, that, that worked for us. That wasn't a big problem. But I could see that it might not work for everyone. Uh, so other people might really like to just start coding and not consider those codes to be concrete categories yet and be fine knowing that they can refine those codes later uh, merge them, delete them, rename them, uh, organize them however you want, and that will work for them. Uh, so 
you know, I, I do understand that the coding tool is a little more powerful in your ability to revise what you've done than the memo tool is. Uh, there's just something still about the memo tool that I kind of like the connotations. And then, as I mentioned before, too, I don't forget about the comments, that you can always write your aha moments as comments on the particular quotations that you're having aha moments about. And you can get to those through the quotation manager, but you can, I don't think you can run reports or or do as many things with those. So in terms of functionality, it seems like codes are the most are most versatile, memos second most versatile, comments on quotations probably least versatile. Ricardo, would you agree with that? Yes, yes, in general, yes. And in fact, I would like to, to follow up with something else that, that Karen uh, uh, wrote. Uh, she, she wrote the following. I have read another paper by Trina and Jessica on performative acts of autism, which looks from the methods section as if it was completely hand coded. So I would be very interested to hear how she would compare the two experiences of analysis with and without Atlas DI. Well, actually, Jessica, that was um, Jessica's dissertation research, and she did actually use Atlas TI and Transana for that for her dissertation. Um, I this is a big problem, and something else that <laughs> I'm working on in other areas of my research life is that journal limitations don't always allow you to talk extensively about the software that you used, and so. I actually did not remember that we didn't talk about using Atlas TI in that paper, and we probably should have. Um, but, and we're kind of trying to make the case more and more that all of us as researchers have to talk more about the tools that we use and how we're using them so that other people know that. So we did actually, I mean, we did use Atlas TI for that, but, it, and it is unfortunate that in the method section that didn't come out. But I can, I can say that in general, I mean, comparing, I mean, I never used Atlas TI until about until about three or four years ago, four years ago, I think, uh, and I would never go back to hand coding. It was a big learning curve, and it was a huge decision for me to take up Atlas TI after doing everything by hand for many years. Um, but uh, it was after I got tenure that I decided to, and that we started this new project that I decided to embrace it. And I couldn't go back to hand coding. The, the, to me, the biggest difference very, is very basic, the ability to code and retrieve. The ability, and that's kind of what all of the software packages do. And it's the one thing that makes you not be able to go back to hand coding is that if I code 100, if I use a code and I apply a code 100 different places across my data, when you do that by hand, you have no way to pull those all back together to look at them systematically without, you know, using an elaborate system of post-it notes or highlighters, and it takes forever. And with Atlas, it's one click, and it's all there. And to me, the code and retrieve itself alone, even if it didn't have any of these other features, is why I, I would never, could never go back to hand coding. Thank you very much. And we have the last question. Uh, Basque uh, is asking, can you elaborate on how to strengthen the, real, the reliability of coding of your material? Do you use an another coder, compute and correlation or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question too. So um, that kind of a question uh, sort of um, to me, uh, is a kind of, it, it comes from a post-positivist paradigm of qualitative research where you're really looking for an objective truth in the data and you are looking for reliability and validity um, and orienting to your data as having the truth if only you can discover it um, by looking, you know, by you yourself and another coder attaining iterator reliability. I, that is not my epistemology. Um, I don't uh, look at our findings as the only truth that came out of this data. Uh, so reliability is not something I'm generally that concerned with in my work, <laughs> which I know is shocking to a lot of people who um, come from post-positivist epistemologies. Um, 
I think that what Jessica and I found in this data is a partial and positioned truth based on um, our interpretations of the data. I'm, I'm much more out of an interpretive paradigm, which is why it is so important for us to document everything that we did. We are not claiming that, um, you know, because we're saying that, because we're being honest that this is our interpretation, you need to be able to see through looking at our Atlas TIHU or how we talk about our analysis exactly what we did and how we made the interpretations that we did in as much detail as possible so that you can disagree with us. Um, I'm not going to pretend that this is a reliable and unique truth um, because it's not, but it is uh, an interpretation that's highly grounded in all of the data that we looked at many, many times. And by documenting those decisions that we made and how we did it and what we did, we leave it up to you to decide whether or not uh, our interpretation is one that you believe or not. Um, so that's, that's kind of my, my epistemological orientation to qualitative research, which is not the same for, I'm sure all of us have a slightly different view of research and, and the kinds of claims that we're making. So uh, I would say that how we deal with issues of what I would call trustworthiness and authenticity is by using a tool like Atlas TI to document everything that we're doing along the way. So anybody could look at it and maybe disagree and that's okay. Thank you, Trina. And would you mind to answer the last question before we finish the session? Sure. Uh, because Ada, she would like to know how you present the results of your research. How I present the results of the research? Uh, yeah. Well, um, in, in terms of uh, these two studies, um, and this is true of lots of discourse analysis and conversation analysis studies, we select representative extracts from the data. So once we have the argument that we want to make about what's happening in the data, we pick three to five excerpts from the data that represent the patterns that we've seen, and we include those as quotations in the reports. And then we, we reanalyze the data for the reader by doing a line-by-line -line analysis of those quotations and what we see is happening in, in, that, ex in, in that extract. Uh, so, and we display that so that the reader, again, can look at how we're analyzing that data and decide whether they agree with us or not um, as we're making the argument about what we think is happening in the data. So that's how, that's how we present the findings. And again, I encourage you to take a look at these papers. I'm happy to send you a copy um, to kind of look at the findings section and, and how we put that together. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your terrific presentation. And uh, I would like to give the microphone to Ricardo to, to make maybe some announcements and then we will finish the session. Okay, thank you very much, Nalinga. Thank you, uh, Trina, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, your support uh, is very important for these webinars to be successful. And uh, I would also like to extend an invitation to those of you who would like to share your experience uh, working with Atlas DI uh, and to please write an email message uh, to me uh, so that we can talk about that and perhaps you could join this webinar series. Uh, showing and uh, sharing your, your, your experience using Atlas DI. Uh, and my email address is, uh, well, you can write to trainingcenter at atlasti.com. Trainingcenter at atlasti.com. Uh, another webinar series that we have is one on qualitative methods. Not Atlas DI, but really something more general. And we have a presentation schedule uh, for uh, next uh, Thursday, I believe it's the Thursday the 10th, and um, by Dr. Carl May uh, from the UK, and uh, you can you can read his uh, the title of his presentation and the details on the Atlas TI website under training. Look for free training, uh, and then look for the tab that says qualitative methods. So we are trying to kind of combine. Uh, uh, free webinars on Atlas TI uh, taught by people from the company teaching the software for free with uh, presentations like today's presentation in which uh, people share their experience, kind of peer learning, and with uh, webinars on qualitative methods. So that's a kind of a system, like a package that we hope 
will be very useful to uh, users of the software. So please uh, join us uh, in our future presentations, both as, as part of the audience as well as as presenters in this specific community of practice uh, series. So thank you very much, Trina. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you very much, Neringa, for your for your uh, moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, thank you all for participating. It was a pleasure to count on all of you. I just want to make a very small announcement about the community of practice. And I would like to say that the next webinar will take place on the 31 of October in English. Dr. Contreras will present the topic about analysis of photo voice data with Atlas TI, a study on the value of labor and managed migration. So I would like to invite all of you to participate. It's very important your participation to make this webinar successful. So I look forward seeing all of you in our next uh, events. And I would like to say thank you one more time and goodbye. So I will give the microphone to you, Jenna, to say goodbye and to close the session. Jenna? Thank you all. Thank you all. I really appreciated the discussion uh, and the opportunity. Thank you, Trina. So thank you all and bye-bye. See you soon. <laughs>